Hey everyone, welcome to my show Friday PM. Uh, we got a very interesting show for you tonight. We have gubernatorial candidate, Mr. Sam Hunkler. Uh, he's an independent. Uh, he's running against Paul LePage and Janet Mills. And just to let you all know uh, early on, we've reached out to them as well. We're a nonpartisan show. We're not trying to uh, promote anybody nor uh, have anything really against anybody. We just want to learn more about everybody. So Sam, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. It's good to see you. So uh, you have a really interesting bio. We'll jump right into that. You're uh, not from Maine. You're from Ohio originally. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I am from Barnesville, Ohio, which is in southeastern Ohio. And it's actually part of Appalachia. Um, so we're in the foothills of the Appalachians. And so I'm actually hillbilly. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and I, was, uh, I was the eighth of nine children. Yeah. I was the seventh of eight boys. Yeah. Um, there's 25 years between my oldest and youngest brother. Um, and so I spent my whole, t uh, whole childhood in Barnesville, Ohio. I first came to Maine when I was 17 years old. Yes. After my junior year of high school, I hitchhiked with a friend up to Loring Air Force Base in Limestone because I had a brother in the Air Force there. And I love Maine, and I wanted to come back. And so, um, uh, but that was my first visit here. And um, so my father was a um, central office repairman for the Ohio Bell. My mother was a homemaker, and she did everything. We lived on a small farm. I actually, her parents were, were dairy farmers. My my dad's parents owned a restaurant in town, and interestingly enough, I just this is a good, interesting story about that. They were the only um, restaurant in town that would serve blacks. Okay. Because somewhere in the late 1800s, the family got typhoid, and the only family that would come to help them was a black family. So, so interestingly, they, yeah, they, they, they were the only town in. Uh, and and what, what year was this? Oh, this was, uh, I think they stopped in. Uh, the early 1950s. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Th this was mainly in the, the from like 1910 uh, to the 1950s. Yeah. So, so this was we, before yes. the civil rights amendments yeah, exactly. and things like that. So they were kind of a uh, progressive yeah, in that way. Progressive. That's the word exactly. So when I graduated from high school, um, I, I I went to Oberlin College up in northern Ohio. Um, and my second semester there, as, as a freshman, I went to France to. Uh, to learn French language, culture, and history. Um, really haven't spoken French since that right, time. Right, but exactly. but I, was, I went there and I was kind of overwhelmed by the whole idea of being pre-med. I thought I wanted to be, do pre-med, but it would, seemed like a pretty cutthroat thing. And I said, I don't know if I want to do that. Right. So anyway, I, I ended up um, graduating there with a BA in biology. Um, and then at that point, I was just kind of burnt out from school. So I decided I, I, I wanted to do something different for a while and decide whether I really wanted to go to medical school. So I joined the Peace Corps. And, and um, I went to East Africa, to Kenya in East Africa. Um, and I was a bush teacher out in the bush by my, you know, I was the only white man around for miles. Uh, but I, it was a boarding school. And I taught English and biology there. And, uh, it was, I actually ended up meeting my future wife there as well. So that was Kelly Kinane from South Portland. Okay. And, and so we met there. Um, um, and um, so it was one of the best things I ever did. It was, right. yeah, it was a great, great experience being in Kenya. And, and so let's just talk briefly about what, what, for those who don't know, actually I feel like the Peace Corps was something that was much more well known than very, very younger people might not even know. Like in a nutshell, what, what, what does one do in the Peace Corps? What were you doing? You were just teaching, was it English? Teaching general sciences? What was it again? Yeah, Peace Corps used to, to, to give aid or to help you know, countries. Actually, the country actually asked the Peace Corps for what they want. Okay. The Peace Corps doesn't say that we're going to give you this. The, the Peace Corps will go uh, to, to countries and say, would you like us to send some people to do whatever? Yeah. And when we went, there was, a, there was one of the gr biggest groups that went to Kenya, and the majority of us were teachers. We were science teachers. Science teachers. Uh, but there was also some, one guy who went over there to work with bees, and another, a couple other people went over to work with co-ops. Uh, but we were there as science teachers. And so we went over there, and we spent the first three months in training, because we had to, number one, learn Swahili. Okay. And the second thing, we just learned about the educational system. So we spent about three months in training, and then they sort of sent us out to the bush school. So. so it was a pretty short amount of training. You yes. got right into it, yes. right in the mix. Yeah. And so how many years was that? That's where you met your wife. You are there probably until your early 20s or well, something? No, I was only there for two years. Okay. I was, I was 22 when I went after college. So right. I, 
Right. Uh, yeah. So I was, was there a little over two years. I think yeah. it's been two years and four months there all together. And so she's the connection to Maine because yeah. she's from South Portland. Exactly. So, but I think you didn't go right to Maine, did you? Or? No, no. Okay. So I went back and um, actually traveled for three months going east to, uh, through uh, India and Nepal, Thailand. and right. did, 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 So I traveled for a few months and then I got back here. And then I ended up teaching at a Quaker school, a boarding right. school for a year. Yep. And and at that during that time I, I did I decided to go to medical school or, and to apply to medical school. So I did during that time apply to medical school. I ended up going to Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland. Okay. Um, and um, actually my, during my first year there, I actually uh, Kelly went to China to teach English. And so and that was just when China was opening up. So it was a very interesting time. They were opening back up. So this is in 1984. Uh, 83, 84, uh, when they were just opening them back up. And so uh, she was over there in Hefei teaching. So I went over there with an excuse to learn acupuncture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I went over there and I did, I, I just followed around to an acupuncturist and, you know, and just to find out what acupuncture is all about. I mean, you really need to spend, you know, a, it's a career. I mean, to really know how to do right, acupuncture. Right. I mean, it's, it's quite a, it's a, just a totally different way of looking at things. But it was interesting because it seemed to, I saw that it didn't work. So anyway, I was you over there. Kind of dabbled in yeah, acupuncture. Yeah, acupuncture. Yeah, it gave me enough to know kind of a, what, that I wasn't going to be doing that. <laughs> well, so, but, but, the, but what's interesting about that is, is you had learned a lot about Western medicine. Mm -hmm. This gave you an idea of kind of a holistic sure. idea, Eastern medicine as sure. well, which we'll get to as we go to your future as a doctor right. but so you get you get back from there you were there with her for a while so yeah i was only there for six weeks okay and, and then so then i came back and then we ended up getting married my third year of medical school okay and we had our first child the next year yeah. uh, in, in cleveland um uh, i graduated from there um i was actually given an award during my graduation for the student that it best exemplifies the characteristics of a family doctor. It, that was almost like a most likely to succeed award. Well, or just somebody who th looked like he was he's going to be a good family doctor. Sort right, of going to be a good yeah. family doctor. Yeah. Which you became a family doctor. Really came. So, yeah. so yeah. I came to, came to Maine, um, and I, I um, chose to come to Central Maine Medical Center in Williston for my residency program. It was a three-year residency, pro residency program. We bought a house, a 200-year-old house in Green Maine. In Green Maine. Maine. Uh, right. where we lived it's about 10 miles north of uh, Lewiston and during the three years we were there we renovated it uh, so that was another right. uh, pretty big project but it uh, uh, but um, so uh, we were, I spent the three years in in Lewiston um, and then afterwards because I was a National Health Scholar in uh, National Health Service Corps Scholar okay. in, in um, medical school and they supported me I had a payback Okay. So I didn't need right, to right. Pay, pay back the time. So I went and did that time in the Indian Health Service in Alaska, in a, a net island reserve in Alaska, um, uh, in Metlakatla. Uh, so, so we went there for three years, and that was quite a quite an experience being there. So now, just for the viewers, this is all, you're still probably, it may, are you in your 30s already? No, I'm, I'm in still your 20s. in my 20s. Yeah. <laughs> That would have been 1990. So we went there in 1990. So I actually would have been in my uh, early 30s. Now. Early 30s. Yeah. So you get to Alaska because this is an interesting kind of side note story uh, that's kind of pop culture. Because this is like the early 90s, I'm yeah, thinking, so right? Because, yeah, yeah. 90 to 93. 90 actually. to 93. And, and you talked about how this was around the time the show Northern Exposure was pretty popular. And you tell the audience a little bit about what happened with that. Well, I think I was there, I had been there a couple of years, and uh, I think it was Good Morning America, came to Alaska. They actually called in the uh, uh, Native Health Service in, in, in Anchorage looking to say, say, we're looking for the real Northern Exposure. Right, right. <laughs> and so they came to Annette Island and they filmed me for about three days there. And uh, the show was supposed to go on. Um, I can't remember, sometime in September, I think of, I don't even know what year, it must have been 93. 93. Uh, and, but, so Ross Perot re announced his candidacy for the, as an independent for presidency, so I got bumped. You got bumped by Ross Perot. <laughs> and he, if you remember, he was doing a lot of these like primetime shows okay. where he'd take over, buy the whole slot of there TV. Which the irony, because they were, you were gonna be the real Northern Exposure sure, right. guy. Yeah. And the irony about the Ross Perot was that he was that third candidate guy. Right. Yeah. So uh, this gets us to kind of like, you get back to Maine, uh, you, you worked I think as a doctor in Ellsworth, Blue Hill, a lot of different places right. around right. Maine. Right. 
When, so I, we were there for three years. Uh, um, two of my children were dor born in Lewiston during my residency program, and then my fourth one and last one was born up in Alaska. In Alaska. So we had four children, came back here. Um, we actually lived in Blue Hill for uh, six months. We had wow. bought land before we, after we renovated that house, we sold it and we bought land in Beals. Yeah. And so we came back in, in the fall of uh, 93, and so we, we lived in Blue Hill for six months, and then we moved up onto the island and to, to build this house. Um, and I started working uh, in emergency rooms. And, I, and so I was working in, in Blue Hill, Ellsworth, and then later at Machias as an emergency room doctor. Because to do that, I, I could go and I could work, I, sometimes you go and work 12 hour shifts or 24 hour shifts, sometimes 48 hour shifts, I'd go to Blue Hill and I would be in the, the hospital the whole time. So I was doing the emergency room, I was doing admissions, I was rounding on patients. Yeah. So I was doing, the, it was a very small hospital, so I was able to do that. And unfortunately, get some sleep in between. That's what I was gonna say, probably sleep in one of the rooms there. That's right, one of the rooms, so they had a, yeah. So. And so what was that a stressful time? Was working in emergency rooms, probably not as stressful as being in an inner city emergency room, but car accidents, there's probably a lot of stuff that's still sure. happening. I mean, the fear was always that something was going to come in that I couldn't handle. Right, yeah. yeah. But it's actually probably worse in Alaska. Yeah. Because I was the only physician on the island a lot of times, and a lot of times when, when it was, you know, there was a lot of vertical rain there because we get, a lot, I mean, we got 12 feet of, of rain a year. Right. And a lot of times the wind be blowing 80, 90, even 100 miles an hour. So you have horizontal, you know, rain. Right. Um, and sometimes you couldn't get people off the island. Right. You know, so I had to hold people there. And I did things there that I I, I wished I never, I, I said, hope I never do again, because it was just. Uh, and this is Alaska. This is Alaska. Okay. So do you have, was there uh, people that were on boats and things that coming in? I mean, hypothermia too? Well, you think that, yeah, like but the big thing was just what was happening there, because like most Native Americans, they were a very um, yeah. oppressed population right right so they had a lot of issues that related alcohol, that, you know, alcohol and, and, and right. you know uh, a trauma of the, all you know emotional physical domestic right. yep. child abuse I mean so but it was just a, res a result of, of the trauma that they had all gone through. and and as a doctor this is what's gonna you know we'll talk about when we talk about your position on drugs and things like that you've seen a lot of it on the front lines you're not the weekend warrior the guy talking about Narcan and whether or not we should give this to people, but they're talking about it from a million miles away. You've seen that in, in the emergency rooms. Yes. And, and at, if, in Alaska, so I didn't realize that. You were more stationed in Alaska towards where there was that population of Alaskans. Well, yes, people. and the biggest thing there is that there was no hospital. I right. was it. And, yeah. and, and if somebody had an emergency, I had to get them on a float plane. Yeah. Or if the float planes weren't running on uh, a ferry and or a boat, a private boat, to get them out of there. Right. So here, at least, I could call in somebody, which I actually never had to do. Right. Yeah. But but it was that's the thing about me working in emergency rooms, it was always that fear that someone would come in, I wouldn't know how to handle it. Yeah. But fortunately, that didn't happen. It never so. happened. That so, never happened. Yeah. And so you, you worked in a lot of the hospitals. You're in Beals, Maine. I, we we want to make sure to talk about the Beals basketball team. I think a lot of people know that, right? Yeah, yeah. But this Jones is Jonesburg goes and Beals is yeah is known for that. Yeah, but it's a very very small community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you enjoy you lived there ever since. Yep. And you enjoy that like kind of a little bit away from all of the hustle and bustle. I love it there. Yeah. I told people I I, ha, I in my career and where I've been I can live anywhere in the world and I think I chose the best place to live. Yeah. So do you there. do you like fish or do any? I, I have a recreational lobster license. Yeah. Uh, one of my sons is on a was on a sturman on a boat. Uh, but the unfortunate thing about right. all this is I'm allergic to shell oh, all yeah. seafood. Yeah, you can't eat seafood <laughs> at all. <laughs> it's, a, it's a family thing. It's an inherited thing. But yeah. yeah. So so after after um. Building our house, so we built our own house. Okay, we did ninety-five percent of the work, and uh, and I so I work on the weekends and these emergency rooms, and then go home and and, and build uh, and um, with help from Kelly and other people at times. Um, and so after about three years of working in emergency rooms, after I went back to family medicine, and so I spent most of my career at Harrington Family Health Center, which was about eighteen miles away, okay. and it is a federally qualified rural health center. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and so I I was there for the the most part of 20 years. But during the while I was there, I also went off and worked some other places. Uh, Kelly and I went back with all of our kids to Kenya for six months. Okay. I went and worked in New Zealand for right. 
for five months. Yeah. I, I also uh, went out and worked at, in, with the Navajo at, in Gallup, New Mexico for a few months. I worked in uh, Corinth, Maine for, uh, I don't know how long, maybe a year. And I worked in Ellsworth at a family, uh, family practice there for two and a half years. Yeah. Then I finished my career right. in Jonesport. Jones just across the bridge. Uh, across. The, 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 the guy who had been there forever retired and they needed somebody, so I came back home and I spent the last two and a half years. And then I retired from the medical system last fall. Okay, yeah. so it was pretty recently. Yeah. So that kind of gets us up to kind of close to modern times here. Yes. Like, I had the question for you, it's like, uh, what what kind of was that moment, the eureka moment where you decided you want to get involved in, in, the, in the governor's race here in Maine? Um, Politics are something I've always kind of thought about, and I need to tell you the story about that. When I, I think I, um, uh, when I was in high school, one of the best things my dad ever gave me was he told me, Sam, I don't care what you do for the rest of your life. You can pick apples if that's what you want to do. Right. Just be able to support yourself and your family. I said, okay. I went off and became a doctor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he had no expectations of me. That's the whole point. He right. didn't expect me to be anything or do anything. But there was a time when I was in, when I came home, I was at home for, for, uh, from college in the summer, and I was on my way out the door, and you know, my friends were waiting in the car, and as I was going out, said, he looked at me and said, Sam, you ever thought about going into politics? And I said, no, not really. Yeah. And so I went, but I went out the door, and I just kind of forgot about it. Right. And then my dad died a few years later, and I never got to ask him why he asked me that. Right. So, so I, it, it, it's something that kind of stuck with me. Uh, and you still don't know. I That's still don't know. Yeah, it's I one still of those things. It's a, you know, I, I, I was very active in high school, not because I wanted to be, because I was just, uh, I mean, I remember I went to, uh, I was, I was uh, president of, of, the, of the student council, I was president of my class, president of the uh, National Honor Society, president of the Club. <laughs> I went to the meeting for the National, uh, National Health, National Honor Society. Honor Society. Um, and I wouldn't even at the meeting, and they voted me. Right, exactly. So, well, you know, I mean, the, I was captain the football team. Captain the football yeah, team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think over and above the idea that you know you have to get good grades and right, you kind right, of have some right. type of a leadership capability right. to be a doctor. Right, right. It's also, you know, I think personally, there probably should be more people that are are doctors that get in politics. I know there's a few mm -hmm. because uh, it adds that empathy. Mm -hmm. That I think that some politicians maybe don't have. Maybe too many lawyers in politics. That you know that they, they look at that lawyers look at people like salespeople look at people, whereas doctors look at people which uh, much more of a holistic view of them. So this kind of gets us to uh, was it last winter that you really went about the well, journey? Well, I had been thinking about it for a while, and actually one of the, one of the things that that really pushed me is um, when Donald Trump was elected, right. he was not a politician, and I watched and I was amazed the influence that one person had not only in this in this country but the world and I said wow I feel like I have led a blessed life right. I feel like I, I I'm filled because I've been so blessed I feel like I want to give something back I could go home and read books now right. you know and you know just I don't have any grandkids at this right. point but you know how my kids out but I just I felt like I'm really, I'm ready to do something different. And I remember even when I was in the Peace Corps, I said, you know what, there's a lot of things I'd like to do with my life, but probably being a doctor, I should do that now, because I'm not gonna to wanna to go to medical school when I'm 50. Exactly. So, so, so here it is, it comes and I said, okay, maybe. I, and I just decided, I have become so disheartened by how things are in this country with politics. You know, as I say, we have a, we have a government of political parties by politicians for special interests. And the people are just on the side, and they're just they're, they're they just throwing their hands up. I mean, right. you know, where, where's the government of the people, by the people, for the people? Right. We need to start have the we need to start at the bottom, and uh, and make those decisions there, so that every four years it doesn't change. Right. You know, flip flop back and forth, how much it does? Because if I believe if we make those decisions from the bottom up, they'll stay. Yeah, and, uh, and the idea that, I mean, I, I'm under the impression that originally, you know, politicians weren't, that wasn't your job. That was something you kind of weaved in and out of from the 
your actual jobs, right? Wasn't that kind of the, right. the basis it's, of it sure. back in the day? That still is in Maine. I mean, it, it's not a full time job. They're there for a few months, but right. everybody has their own job. Right, right. You know, and so they but go Washington there. has but, a lot yeah, right, of professional exactly. even, politicians. Yes, right. yeah, even, even the big big wigs, you know. Right. That yeah. seems to be those people. Once right. they get there, it's really hard to want to leave. Well, and and uh, I'm going to go back to something you said yeah. in the beginning: is that I'm running for governor. I'm not running. I'm standing. Standing, right. And, and so, the, and the difference there. Yep. Is that in the beginning of our country, uh, before there were political parties, a community would go. To, well, back then it was a white man, right? Exactly. <laughs> in the community, right. and they would say they would pick somebody who they thought would represent them well. They didn't have a political party. They said this, this man has an honesty and integrity, and and so would would you stand for office? Right. You know, they would say, would you stand for office? And some of them said yes. Some of them said no. But there was not the uh, there wasn't a political party then. So, I mean, it kind of in that same way, it was like, it wasn't like now where people actually have to kind of like grin and bear it with some of the people because they happen to be, right? So it's like, there's a lot of people who probably aren't too big of fans of Donald Trump, but they will still vote for him because he's better than the other guy and vice versa and so on and so forth. So that's where it's a lot more, and what, I mean, this is going a little further down the road, but. I mean, would you like to see where there's a multi-parties, maybe five or six? Well, at least a third party. Yeah. You know, right. at least a, an, another party that, that, and probably more than anything, is that when, mm, the first thing I would say to the legislature, if I, during my inaugural speech would be, you are here to represent the people of Maine. You are here to represent your constituents, not your party. Right, right. Yeah, because they have to. I mean, everybody's tied to their party because if they don't follow, the, the party's going to come down on them, and, right. they, they, and they may not support them. Right. I am an unenrolled independent, so I'm not part of a party. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, there was like five different issues that you feel like you just let's get these out of the way because you're going to get asked this all the time. And do you want me to say those issues, or you want to say them? I, I can go through them. Cause I can. So yeah. this is what I found on the road. Okay. You know? And, and I, I can tell you that. I was on the road for three months. It was the, probably the hardest work I've ever done. People that know I did this, they say, how did you do that? Because I don't think any governor has gone out and got 92% of those signatures themselves. Probably not. Yeah, and, exactly. and so because, I, you know, the, there's the two other uh, recent uh, independents, Jim Longley and um, Angus King, Right. They had money, yes. so they paid people. As a matter right. of fact, I just signed a position out there from somebody who's doing something. I'm, they're paid people. They come. They, they, was it Elliot Cutler also one of these? Yes, guys? yes. Yeah, exactly. he, he, he had a lot of money. Too, yes, right. yeah. So they, they they paid people to go get the signatures. Right. But I was out there, and so I feel like I really got a pulse of the people. These are the five issues. That, so, and what I would say is, it doesn't make any difference how I what my position is on these five issues. Yes, I will lose. 30% of the vote. No matter what. No matter what it is, okay? And they are abortion, right. COVID and vaccines and mandates, right? okay? Uh, guns. Yeah. Um, this is the kind of a, a general thing about environment, but also in, in particular the corridor and how I voted on the corridor. And then a lot of people want to know, did I vote for Trump or Biden? Right. Okay. So I want to just, right. somebody tell people, I want to get those out of the way. Right. Because we're not going to find common ground on this. For, 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 for reasonable people, I think we could, but there's the 30% that no matter how I answer that, you're not going to really, I'm not going to find common so this ground. So the, this is, these are the five issues that you want to be upfront with people yep. and tell them because, you know, take it or leave it, right? Yeah, this, this is where, right. and, and they are very divisive right. issues that the media, the media is part of the problem because they want to know this all the time and they keep bringing it up and they, they run around, you know what that, that does. So and the more you get these out of the way, yeah. the gotcha questions. Yeah. Yeah. So then maybe we can find some things we started finding common ground. You can find common ground about. So I mean, with abortion and the COVID uh, uh, kind of mandates, it seems to me like you have kind of a libertarian viewpoint, right? Is it kind of hands off your body a yeah, little? Yeah, I think for both of those. Um, I mean, for me, it's, I believe the government should have no jurisdiction over my body. Right. Period. Right. I mean, I don't have anything else to say about it. Right. I, I, the, the government should be doing that. Now, a lot of people want to split that. We say, well, with abortion, it's this, and or, or, you know, abortion's okay, but this is, you know, vaccines right. are, you know, whatever. But for right. me, it's the same thing. 
Keep yeah. your hands off my body. Right. Keep your laws off my body. Right. Yeah. So. Well, and that's a, and, a, and I don't want to digress, but it, that'll be a very quick question. Uh, but are you then for the legalization of all drugs? Because that's often similar. Like, hey, let me, let me do whatever I want to do to my own body. Maybe not, because sometimes with drugs you can harm other people too. You well, know? you can. And the other thing is, is that when you're not taking services, when when the MS is called to your home because you're in a right. stupor, right? Okay, you're using you're using yeah. And so, right. I, no, no, I, right. you're, you're not doing, for doing anything destructively. No, but like, if you're doing, I mean, you know, who thought 50 years ago that marijuana would be legal? Probably not a lot of people. <laughs> Similar thing, I think, and I wouldn't speak for you. It's like. You're kind of saying, look, I'm not for everybody being able to jump off of bridges whenever they want, mm -hmm. because then you're going to have to go clean up the mess and all the rest right, of it. Right. Right. There right. could be things that it creates a public right. public right. health. When you're issues. breaking the law, that, that, that's a different issue. Right, yeah. right. And yeah. so, but that, those two issues, you're pretty consistent on them, and that makes sense. With guns, though, you might have a different uh, feeling than what, what people might think, just as their yeah. gut reaction. What's your feeling on guns? Well, here's my gut reaction. I mean, I used to hunt, I used to trap animals, and so I don't have a problem with people hunting. Yeah. Um, and so how I look at it is I, I don't have a problem with somebody going out and killing a deer. I have a problem with the, with the potential of being able to go out and shoot a herd of deer. Right. So where, where, there's, where there's a weapon of mass destruction, I don't know why we need those in our society. Right. I think that you know, people have them. Yep. I don't support them because I don't see a need for them. Right. No, I understand it. Yeah. Like uh, assault weapons. Assault and weapons. Like I mean, don't I just don't understand. I mean, a lot of people, for a lot of people, it's really about, for them, it's about, and I think they're kind of like on the far right, uh, that, that they think that they have to arm themselves against against the government. Right, you right. Know? They take that whole thing in the Constitution very literally. Exactly. And they think that, and then, you know, and versus you probably feel like hunting's okay. Also, you know, if you have to have a gun in your house because you're worried about sure. intruders, sure. and if you live in a rural community, yep. that's often that's talked about because yep. it takes a lot longer for the police to get yep. to you, right? Absolutely. And Absolutely. so that's, you know, but, but you don't need a machine gun to no. protect of a burglar, no, most likely. No, no, no. Exactly. <laughs> right. you have a handgun, whatever. But right. so I, I guess that's my that's where right. I would draw that line. I don't know. I don't see the need for that. Right. Yeah. And the energy corridor. Before you tell us the position and the environment thing, it's. I think you'd be surprised to find out. Some people don't even know what that topic is. Energy corridors. It's a that that the. the Electrical grid they're trying to do here. And yeah, well, it, it's the CMP wanted to go through right. public land with yep. their grid, with electric grid coming from, I think it's Quebec Hydro, the, right. the, to bring hydropower down through Maine to Maine, Massachusetts. And Maine was going to benefit. I don't, I don't know the details of that. Right. But the, the, the thing about the referendum, it was about, do you support um, them not? I think the question was, I, it was a yes question if you were That's against them doing that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Doing it on public land. Right. Just going through public land that to, to do that. And so that and so for me, uh, I look at our environment and our natural resources as one of our biggest um, assets. Right. Not, the people are the biggest, but that's probably the next. I mean our, our, our the ocean, our mountains, our streams. And and I and I think that's why we live here for right. to because right. to, we love we love the outdoors and we so we need to protect the out, outdoors while allowing for sustainable use. Yes. But if there's a public land, I don't think we need to be building anything through it. I mean, it's, it's public land, which means that if you put a corridor through it, it's going to kind of ruin it. Kind of ruin it. Yeah, so, uh, so I voted yes. I, the pr but here's a, well, it's another issue, but the whole problem with that, that referendum is there were actually three parts to it, and you couldn't separate them out. So that one thing is, as a governor, when you do a referendum, I want one issue. Don't don't make it complicated because I don't really even know what I was voting for. I was voting for 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 the for them not to go through that through the public land, but there were two other issues there, and I didn't know about. I mean, yeah, and, and, yeah, and so it, so anyway, that's a that's no, a, I mean, another that, issue. Right, that's another thing about the yeah. referendums. And, and then uh, Trump Biden. Yeah. So and a lot of people on the road said, "Who'd you vote for? Who'd you vote for?" And I said, "I didn't vote for either one of them." Right. So yeah. I didn't. I, I voted, I, I think, for the Libertarian this past time. I'm not even sure. So, yeah. So. Well, it was, it's, you know, it's, it, it was a tough election, and I, and I know that it's not for... But I think that, that that goes to kind of the idea that we, we were talking about a lot, was that tell me about your viewpoint on, you know, the, the folks that are going to be out there that think, oh, you're just going to be stealing the votes from one of the other people, 
And I don't believe that that's a great way to look at things over and over again, because it's always going to be that way. But you're going to have a lot of those naysayers. You've already run into a lot of them out there. And, and what's, what's your thoughts on that? Well, so they did a recent poll where there's, they're pretty close, and that was without a third party person. And I can guarantee you that if you give the choice of the Republican between Mills and, and LePage, even though they don't want LePage, they're going to vote for him. And the same with a Democrat. You know, you give the choice, so they're going to vote Democrat. If they want the Democrat right, they definitely don't want the Republican. Right. So those, that's the law of those people. And so for me, you know, and it was really the Democrats who talked about splitting the vote. Uh, and because Elliot Cutler did that, they think so. But a couple of things I have to say about that. Number one, Elliot Cutler was a Democrat. Yes. He was a Democrat. Oh. He'd been a Democrat. He worked for Democrats his whole life. But he ran as an independent. So th that's why he got a lot of Democratic votes, because yeah. he was a Democrat. Um, and uh, and he almost won the first time. He came with when one and a half percentage points. Of, of, and, and the Democrat came in. Quite a bit lower, like a I don't know. Libby Mitchell. Yeah, 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 I think that was right. Yeah, yeah. and it was a, it in was the twenty percent, sir. And from what I remember, it was almost kind of like a like the the like Mexican standoff, as they call it, where who would back down, like a game of chicken, because some people were telling her she should drop out right, and right. let him win, right. and some people were telling him that sh that he should drop right, out. Right. And neither of them would do it. Right. Uh, so maybe they both have something to blame for right. what happened, Absolutely. at least for yeah. from the folks that don't like LePage, exactly. uh, but from the side that, that likes LePage, they were happy about yeah, it. And absolutely. I think there was Sean Moody was involved a little bit, uh, and he was more Republican, but I think he dropped out. Okay. But I think talking about a third party, it doesn't always sway that way. It's not always Ralph Nader. It's not always uh, yeah. the lady that was most recently in, involved in Jill Stein, I okay, think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we talked about Ross Perot, he definitely took a lot more people from George Bush Sr., and that's where Bill Clinton was able to win. So it, it cuts both ways, but does. but your candidacy isn't about trying to sway it one way or another. No, You're not a hidden operative for no, the no, Republicans I, or the Democrats. I've never been a Democrat or Republican. Right. I've always voted independently. Yeah. Um, and so, and I believe that I I have some Republican views. I'm more, I'm right. probably more libertarian than anything if I had right. to choose, but I'm not really libertarian, but right. I'm more that way than anything. I, I, I think that, um, I would, I think that our government sometimes is too big. I think they, you know, when they start mandating things that I don't like, I don't think that that's, that should be the case. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I can, and, but I can be conservative and I can be liberal. And so I am a true independent and I've always been that way. And the, 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 the biggest voting block in Maine are independents. And I know a lot, as I said before, I, I know a lot of Democrats who don't really want to vote for, for Janet Mills. And I know a lot of Republicans who don't want to vote for Paul LePage. Right. And so and so many people said, thank you. Thank you for giving us another choice. Right. So I'm not splitting the vote. If anything, I could say the same about them. If I don't win, they split. The, they took my votes. They take the votes, right, from so, the equal side. So, and it's really, you know, it's the American way, you know. It was so refreshing being out on the on the on the road when I was you know, my my standard question is would you be willing to sign for me to be on the ballot for governor? And some people look at me and say they'd say sure, and they say yes. Every anybody who, who wants to run should be on the ballot. And there were others who they would stand there and talk to me and they would ask me question after question. I meant that, and it went, went and it got to question ten and I answered the wrong way. They were gone. They were gone. Yeah. So yeah. and so and there were some who said absolutely not. And so and you know a lot of the. The far left are those, I call them the, the Mills Warriors. They're, and they said, no, you're gonna split the vote. And then on the right, they were just, no, I got my I got my guy. And so that's fine, you know. And yeah, I mean, I think it happens. And I think that in a perfect world, <clears throat> you know, if there was four even candidates, so there was, you know, and I think that happens more in Europe, you might have a far right and a far left right. and a medium and a medium. Right. And then you're starting to have a lot more things going on. Right. And it's not that idea that oh, it's it's like a, you know, like a one egg that's getting split in two and right. all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I think just to, you, I definitely want to talk to you about you, you know what your feelings are about the opioid problem. That's one of the things that uh, I've talked to some people on my show about. I mean, that's definitely hitting Maine like a hammer. Uh, you're from having spent some time or basically grown up in the Appalachians. They were hit in almost the exact same way as Maine. You're a doctor. I mean, it's almost as though, fingers crossed, you, you don't actually not win the governor for you, 
but I, I could see you maybe being the attorney, the Surgeon General or something of Maine, because you must have some ideas. Something's got to get fixed here. I mean, uh, somebody suggested to me whether they should have drug courts. You said they do have drug courts. They don't work that well. I don't want to say too many things on a question, but what's your thoughts on the whole opioid? What are we going to do to fix this? Well, it's, it's a huge problem, and it, it, it affects so many people, uh, not only the addict, but if they have a spouse, if they have children, if they have a family, and, and, and parents are just been distraught when they know that their child is doing this because at any time they, they, they know they can die because of the statistics out there. So it affects the whole community, and, and it is a major problem. And so even though you have these so many dying and seem to be dying more and more, and we spent millions and millions and millions of dollars trying to do, make a difference, it's not, have, it's not working. Or it, we, we need to think about doing something different. My, from my perspective, the number one health issue in this country is mental health. And uh, mental health affects, certainly does affect physical health. It's mental health and spiritual health. I would go even saying that. Um, and what I do know is that we all have issues. And the more issues we have, the more we're going to turn to some type of addiction to get away from them. We all have trauma. We all have had gone through trauma, abuse, and neglect. You know, some people it's minimal, but for some people it's huge. Right. Yeah. You know? when you've been sexually abused, you know, physically abused, neglected, you know, and so part of the whole problem with addiction is people are trying to get away from that. That's the whole idea of addiction is to get away from this dis-ease within us. And I, for addicts, it's the only time where they feel okay. Yeah. It just all goes away. Right. I understand, but the problem is then it becomes an addiction, so they can't do without it. They've got to have it every day. So for me, so, and, and, and the, the paradigm for the system is to treat these, the street addiction with other addictive pharmaceutical products. That's the, that's the. That, that's a Suboxone and mex method. That's, and that's something that you, you talked about you're not a fan of, right? Which well, I, I am a fan for short term, very short right, term. But not to get people off the streets, get them stable, get them so that they're not withdrawing all the time. Right, right. But for me, it's a bridge and it should be a very short bridge because people need to start doing their work. They need to start doing recovery work. Right. And people are being mandated into, you know, 12 step programs. That's not going to work. Right. You know, because you can't mandate this. You can't tell people they have to do it. But one of the things I would love to see do us do, yeah. I want to turn at least one of our prisons into a rehabilitation center so that people go and they actually start rehabbing. And so if you, if for example, this is one thing. If you are revived for, with, with, with Narcan, if you're found in a stupor, a, a opioid stupor, and you were revived, you have a choice to go to prison or to go to inpatient drug rehabilitation for six months, or whatever that that, that is. Yeah, okay. And during that time, you actually do rehabilitation. Most addicts feel like a piece of crap. They treat themselves and, like and that. They and they, and they treat themselves crap. like yeah. crap. You know, yeah. they have so much shame and guilt from what they've been doing. And again, they just keep doing it because when they when they when they're using that all goes away for a short time. But then they wake up and they have to deal with what they did the day before when they were stealing something. Look at how much of our prison system is filled with drug related crime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, I think that that's what happens is that it's uh, it's like you said, it compounds because your life starts falling out of control and you, it's a, it becomes a, a pebble, becomes a, a giant rock rolling down the hill. It makes it harder and harder. Yes, it does. So you, you feel, have you seen, is this a thing that's worked any other places that you know about? It has worked. It's in, worked in other states. When people I've worked with, it has worked. Uh, the problem okay. is I'm not a program, but, but, I, yeah. but, but I actually have, I've, I've, I've have um, prescribed Suboxone for years. But for me, it's always a bridge, and it's always, you know, the problem is, in my practice, I mean, th there was a requirement that, that people went to, uh, to counseling, that they, that they um, be in some kind of 12-step program as part of, the, of getting their, 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 their drugs. The problem is, the more they're on their drug, they're extremely addictive. I mean, even Suboxone is very difficult to get people off them because they're, they're so addictive. Right. It has to be a very slow process, but people have to, and, and, and medical practitioners 
don't really want them to do that because every week they come in, people are making money, the system's making right, money right. on them, yeah. you know? Right. And so there's no paradigm outside of the use of these drugs. And have you seen, uh, uh, is that hard hitting the parts of Maine that you that you oh, live absolutely. in? Yeah, absolutely. So the smaller towns are getting hit. Absolutely. I've had hard too, my right? kids' friends. Some of them died from overdoses. From overdoses, yes. Yeah. And, and, and it affects the whole community. And so it's a huge problem. But we're I think what we're going about. So now all these people on these drugs are now dependent on the system. Right. And yeah. It's, and it's causing it's costing millions of dollars to do that. And we have got to give the responsibility of this problem back to the person. And as your time in, when you were in Alaska, because you work with the native population there, uh, you see what some people think, and again, I'm you know, not the guy saying it one way or another, but there's a lot of people that think if some people, they're always dependent on the system, they're never gonna be able to feel any better about themselves, things like that. And you're saying more system. So uh, what about, you know, with Bill Clinton, I thought he had a thing that was like a work fair or to get your welfare you had to be working or you're doing something jobs programs right. something i mean what what are we going to do where we have two things right sam we got mm -hmm. we've got this drug problem uh let's not forget we also have an unemployment problem where these jobs dried up they can't be coincidental can right, they right, right. so what do you what what's the theory how are we going to get people back to be doing it even if even if we're doing things that's like a like a jobs program, right? Like the Great uh, the Depressions and these programs in those days, mm -hmm. is that possible? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think it's possible. Yeah. I don't know, you know, that's about the yeah, level. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. right. Um, part of this whole idea of putting people in, you know, opening a prison for rehabilitation. Yeah. I mean, I would like to see where the whole family can go there because the whole family needs rehabilitation. Right. The whole family has been traumatized by, by, by the, the action of the addict. Um, and, and the behavior of the addict, and so and so, I don't want to really separate families, but part of that can also be that part of that rehabilitation is getting them back to work. Right. But That's, they have, you know, from right. from where they are, and so you, it may be part time, but you start to do that. But what has to happen more than anything else is that people, as I tell right, people, right. they have to fit, find, they have to come to the realization that they are okay. Right. Their behavior is not. Okay, their attitude maybe not, but we're all the same. We all come to the same people and from the same place, and nobody's any better than anybody else. Right. But the shame that, and, and the guilt that these people carry makes them think that they're a piece of crap, and they're not. But their behavior has to change. Well, it's, I think it's, it's, it's kind of like what we're talking about. It's that it's, they've carried that over and made it worse and worse with all their actions, exactly. but then they probably, 90% of it, and as a doctor, you see more people than I do as a personality, but then a lot of these people, they probably didn't have upbrings where they were given much uh, well treatment or treat, you know, so it's a very self-fulfilling prophecy. They never started with that, exactly. those tools. And so before we go too much into all of the weeds of things, because I don't, we might run out of time, <laughs> like, uh, what, what are the kind of the, the top four or five things that you think that Maine really needs that could be great that you could add to it, or even that you don't necessarily know, you know, you could have, but what are those things? And where, if, if you got into power or got to be the governor, uh, where would you be able to see those things in Maine in the next five or six years? Like what, where are we on the precipice of? Where could we get to that next level? Well, I mean, uh, again, I think one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with uh, that affects our whole system is mental health. Yeah. Um, and I think where I would like to focus more than anything is in community. Yeah. In communities and in and, and the community within communities. Right. right. Um, and to go along with that, a focus on children. So you look at children. Yeah. Children need a safe place to grow up. They need housing. They yeah. need stable housing. Look at our look at our problem with housing. So if you start looking at children, you're going to start going in a lot of the different things like housing and education, and um, and how they are, you know, children are still being abused. I mean, and so how, how do how do you com children need community? They really need community. A, a, a community should a community should raise the, ch the child, the not child. not just the parents. So it should be a, a whole community raising children. And so I would love, for example, to bring um, to bring elderly and children together. Right. right. Children need the elderly. 
The elderly, they have their patience, they have their, their, their kindness. As we get older, we kind of mellow out. <laughs> We're not, they, you know, we, we come to kind of accept ourselves more. Yeah. And so, so the, uh, the elderly have a lot to give children. So was this something that you saw more when you, because you've traveled a lot to other countries, I think that that's more well known in, in South America and other countries where we don't have these issues. And that's why there's issues in Asia when there's suicides because the elderly have been disenfranchised where for uh, since the beginning of time that 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 they, everybody stayed in the same household yeah. and in the US that doesn't happen as much yeah. there's community in Africa where I was there was community I mean the whole community I mean you'd see five-year-old kids walking down the road with a with a newborn or a one-year-old on the back you yeah. know right, right. and they'd be with three other kids right. and they could go in any hut they wanted you know and so there was really the, the whole the, there was a community there and, and people, the kids felt welcome. If a child has just one person that they know loves them, it makes all the difference in the world. Right. Where they can get nurturing and comfort. It makes all, whether it's a grandmother, a neighbor, whoever, when they, that somebody that shows them that they're okay can make a world of difference for them. And so the mental health issue where that ties in, because that does make sense to me in the sense that this is, you could start right at the top. It's almost like, you know, about Maslow's Pyramid of Needs. And that now, if you start with mental health, you're gonna be, the trickle down, hopefully, is maybe we could cure this homeless issue that's going on a lot in Portland. Because I think what happens in Portland is you have all these people are getting shuffled here from other parts of Maine, other places. So it's a symptom of, it's like the, as a doctor, it's like the wound that's a symptom of what's going on inside. Exactly. But that's the mental health thing, and so, you're, you, where and, and do you think you could start with a legislature? Do you think you'd start with where do you think that you get where do you get these people to get this stuff? Well, I think it's I think it comes back to grassroots and it, yeah. it starts. There are communities. I mean, for example, on Beals Island. Uh, this is just one example. Yeah. Uh, um, so I, I worked I worked in nursing homes, okay. and whenever I was in a nursing home and a child came in, the whole place just lit up. Right. You know, yeah. the elderly need those children just as much as the children need, need, right. need, need the elderly. And another part of the example is there was a, there's a woman, her name is Lorraine, and she was in the, uh, she was a cook at the grade school, and all my kids knew her, and they loved her, and she was just as, you know, a grandmother to all of them. Then she went over to the nursing home, worked there as a cook, and now she's in her, she's in her uh, early 90s, and she sits home every day by herself. Right. And it's not healthy for her. She's isolated. She lives a quarter of a mile away from the school. Think about her going to school every day to have lunch with those kids. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just a, something simple like that. And so uh, maybe we have that, where, where the elderly come in and just have lunch every day with the kids. Right, right. So you build that community. Right. And maybe you put daycare in schools. Yeah. There was a, uh, you know, Tom Gronig, uh, Gron, Gron, he's a, the Waterfront paper, uh, I don't know if you, Waterfront Institute, I think it is. Maybe. Okay, yeah, yeah. But he just wrote an article about education. And he said, you know, is it really healthy that, you know, we have all 10 year olds together? in one class and all 12 year olds at the other one class it used to be we'd have one year one room schoolhouses right. and the older kids would help the younger kids and that's actually how you know you, lo you learn right. if you can teach it you know you've got to know it yeah. so having that and having having daycare in there so the kids can go and see you know and 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 actually maybe even take care of the kids right, a little better. Right, right. and then you have the elderly in there who can you know if some kid needs to be sitting from class they go and they sit on the lap i don't know but yeah. you, i'll have to monitor but I, that would help commu uh, get a bigger community yeah, yeah yeah and then maybe you'd have some young people come in and maybe that would help them get off their phones right, you know? exactly you know you know maybe you have activities but I mean, that's just an idea. And, and so I would like to foster that. Maybe we have some pilot programs to do that. I would like the, the communities to pay for that right. or, or people who have who are philanthropy within the communities to help make that happen. And let's right. see, what, see if it happens. I think that it actually happens more in rural areas, but there, there's not as much there as there was you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think it's, it's become more separated, right. more isolated. And, that, and I think that that's a bigger, kind of thing that's been happening all over the country is more and more people have moved to the cities. They're, they're much less personal. It's difficult. And I think that that's where the, the there's just got to be some type of a new overhaul with the economy where the economy's not really tied to nature anymore, right? I mean, it, it seems like the economy back in, you know, even as a kid when I was growing up in Wilton Farmington, 
they were in the mills. There was economy that with the lumber. There was economy with uh, dairy. I mean, it's still around, I suppose. But I mean, there's probably machines doing most of it now instead of people milking. There's less farmers. Mm -hmm. There's there's just a lot of overhaul. Uh, but do, are you optimistic about Maine in the next few years? Do you think it's going to be? Can we can we find these changes we need? I believe we can. Yes. I'm not sure that the Republicans and Democrats can choose the right. <laughs> They're the ones to do it, right? Well, because they don't have a very good track record, right? You know, right. and all they do seem to fight. They, again, it, if it starts from the bottom up, right. it can be more permanent, right? You know, I'm not big about you know um, the government um, c c running programs, but it can support programs, you right. know. So we're not, and and maybe it can help with money as well. But we gotta come up with something different. I certainly don't have all the answers. Right. And one of the things I really would like to do is I would like to govern with counsel. Yeah. I would like to have a council of advisors. Right. I say a council of elders, well, but, <laughs> but, but, right. but I, they're not just elders. Right. I want young people. I want a diverse council to help advise me on everything we do. And then maybe there can be a council that, the other thing I think we really need to do is we need to have oversight of our, our government, like the Department of Education. What I'm finding is nobody really knows how these departments work. Right, right. You yeah, know, yeah. You, you, I appoint a commissioner, but the, the department's already there. It's, it's been there forever, and it's got people, in, uh, those people don't change. And there's a, there's a system there, it's like, it, it's like locked down, you know? It's right. like a bunker that you've got to get in and, you know, you can, yeah. <laughs> so I'm interested in going in there and looking, and I would like to have an advisory council on every one of those, and every one of those Department of Education, the DHS, look at DHS. I had a had a, a woman that I met up in Norwalk who who worked for um, or somewhere up there I'm not sure was that somewhere in Somerset County kind of, but she worked for the Department of D, the DHS for Department of Human Services yeah, yeah, yeah Department yeah. of Health and Human Services Health the and human HHS Services. Yeah, yeah. yeah she worked for them for 30 years and her comment was it was an absolute shit show it's a total mess it's right? a total mess oh, yeah what's that mean yeah and what and and but there's no oversight of these departments. You know, right. and and I bet the I, I was at the um, main chamber of commerce today, and I, I asked the audience, says, "Who here knows how our government works?" Yeah, and not one. There were, must have been knew. seventy people there. Not <laughs> one hand went up. So, uh, where do people find the way to get in touch with you? Stand, stand with Sam. Stand with Sam. On Facebook, right. right? Well, on Facebook, but this is my website. Website. Um, yeah. And so that's where to start. This is a very grassroots campaign. Right. I'm right. taking no donations. Exactly. Yep. Um, I want to. Money corrupts politics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, if it, somebody gave me five thousand dollars, you don't think I'm going to think of them if an issue comes up or, exactly. that, that, that involves them? Right. You think right. I'm not going to think about that? Right. So you're taking no donations. No right? donations. But but you can volunteer. You can support me. Support and the, biggest, the biggest out. way to support me right now, okay, is to get the word out. Get the word out. Get yeah. the word out and and invite me to come to yeah. your home right. or to right. uh, have a forum and I will come. Okay. And it's really going to be grassroots. And I'm uh, the other thing I'm very aware of, and I, I became aware of pretty quickly, is that people have political fatigue. They have election fatigue. They do not want to hear about it right now. It's, it's summertime. You know, I think our primary should be in September, not June, so that then you have two months of campaigning. And that's what I'm waiting to do. I'm, I'm going to be doing things like this, you know, and, and talking to people, maybe going to meetings, but I'm not going to be campaigning until the fall okay. because I don't think people want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about it. Right, right. But so, you want to get out there, and maybe you're on like more of a listening tour. And that's sense, right, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. A listening tour, and right. just uh, because. A lot of people don't even know that I'm on the ballot, and they don't know who I am, and that's what my website will help help you see. And it, it, I mean, it, it's a it's a pretty it's not a professional website, but I think it has what you need. Right, right. You're not trying to be the flashy guy. No, you, no. you the, I mean, you're going to local papers. You're talking yeah. at local. I've had a number. I've had a number of articles written about me. Yeah. They're on my website in the press section. Right. I've had some very good articles written, and, and uh, people are intrigued. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a great summer for you. Well, I've, I've learned a lot. It's been grueling, but yeah. it's, I've learned a lot. I've met some really great people, yeah. and uh, it, it's exciting. Um, um, and, but it's been a lot of work, That's and I'm, right. I'm ready. To, I, and as I said, I'm ready to put my heart into this. In, into the and into, into the state of Maine and the, and yeah. the people here, uh, I have I've met thousands and thousands of people in my my profession. 
Uh, I know things about people that no one else does. There's an intimacy I have with them, and I feel like I have a pretty good pulse of the people in Maine. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I think that uh, that's what I'm going on. You just got to get the word out there. That's right. So get stand the word with out. Sam. Uh, invite him to any of uh, your events coming up. Absolutely. Uh, and his website again is uh, standwithsam22.com. 2022. 2022.com. Yep. Uh, back here. I think it's going to be a lot of fun for you this uh, this fall. And I want to say thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Yeah, yeah, thanks yeah, a lot. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody. Uh, remember, the invitation is open to Paul LePage and Janet Mills. We don't want to seem like we're only on one side of the fence here. Uh, but I want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye.